Hi, and welcome to this overview of new romance releases that I read that were published in June of 2023. I'm Olivia, your favorite resource for book recommendations you can easily screenshot. You're watching Random Olive Reads. First up is The Beast and the Bookseller by Eva Devon. Elizabeth is the daughter of a bookshop owner and basically runs the shop while her father drowns himself in alcohol after the death of her mother. It turns out that her father has been shirking his duties to a cold and starchy duke who normally receives weekly deliveries of books at his home. The duke, Garrett, comes calling at the shop to demand the bookshop service that he pays for or else he will remove his patronage to the shop. Elizabeth agrees to start making the book deliveries herself, and they both find that they have a love of reading in common. Garrett has his own issues with his crusade against treacherous mental asylums, and he has been somewhat of a cold recluse. With Elizabeth's visits, they grow closer, and he wants very much to care for her. The romance part of the story progressed pretty quickly, with some conflict related to Elizabeth's father and Garrett's general coldness, but it was a relatively quick read and fairly light on the angst. Next is Kiss the Rake Hello by Tracy Sumner. It is book 13 of the Wicked Widows League series. Now this series is a multi-author collaboration, which is why there's so many books in the series. This one here is a quick novella where a widow, Alexandra, and her childhood neighbor, Cortland, meet again. He has had a crush on her forever, and she's looking for a one-night stand after her disappointing marriage. It's a pretty uncomplicated plot, but sweet to see Court become shy and fumbling around the woman that he's loved since he was a kid, playing pranks on her and trying to get her attention. This was super short, but fun to read. Designs on the Duke by Alexa Aston is book four of the Suddenly a Duke series. We have a tragic upbringing for Elijah, who is some crusty old duke of a father, accused his wife of being unfaithful and tossed the pregnant duchess off to a small cottage at one of his estates with no money or support. So basically, Elijah grew up knowing he was the legitimate son of a duke, but also knowing he was treated poorly. So the duchess gave birth to twins and eventually saved up enough money to send them both off to the army. Now, while in battle, the elder of the twins passes away, leaving Elijah to be the heir. Almost within minutes, he receives a letter from his mother saying that his father has died, leaving his brother the next duke, although his brother's gone too, which means that Elijah is the new duke. This is all happening in like the first two pages of the story. Um, he's back in England to reclaim his birthright and set things to rights. Unfortunately, the crusty old duke was a spiteful piece of work who sold off every single piece of furniture in the entire house over multiple houses. Luckily, they run into Abby, who is soon to open her own furniture shop filled with her designs. Now, Abby had lived in poverty until her father's death when her new guardian took her with him and brought her on his travel adventures. With all of the knowledge that Abby has gained in traveling the world, she's developed a keen sense of style and design and is designing furniture. Now, neither Elijah or Abby are interested in marriage. Elijah doesn't want to continue his horrible father's bloodline, and Abby doesn't want to give up control of her independence. But as they start working together to furnish his home, they begin to admire each other's strength and honor and blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know what happens. But it was a fun little spin on how they got together. Chasing the Bride by Erica Ridley is book six of the Lords in Love series. Tabitha has been betrothed to her father's Viscount friend since before she was born. And with her father on his deathbed, the wedding shall be held in pretty short order. Tabitha has no interest in marrying the lecherous old man, but feels like it's her role as the dutiful daughter to comply. Now, she spends some of her last days of freedom at the Marywell Matchmaking Festival, but her betrothed has assigned his man of business to watch over her. Hudson has worked for the old Viscount for years and has been unwisely pining for Tabitha, despite being at a much lower social standing. 
While he is confident at his assigned tasks, he is dreading the day when Tabitha has to marry the Viscount. When she's spending time with Hudson, Tabitha actually realizes what true joy and companionship is, making her dread her looming marriage even more. She ultimately runs from her wedding day, hoping to stall her fate just a little bit longer, but Hudson eventually catches up to her, and then she convinces him to spend a week with her before he has to bring her back, even though that's his, like, main job. This book was a lot of fun to read, with our two people easily falling in love, but kept apart due to external circumstances. Her Scandalous Scott by Jennifer Haymore is book two of the Highland Nights series. This was previously published as Highland Awakening in 2015, and this version is updated with some content changes. This book is also connected to Jennifer Haymore's House of Trent series. Now, Lady Esme is the socially awkward sister of a duke, but also a secret author of romance novels. While doing research at a brothel, she runs into Camden while he is on protection duty of an earl. He doesn't know who she is at first, but uncovers her identity while at the Duke's dinner party. Now, she is nearly engaged to a seemingly safe family friend and trying very hard not to succumb to Cam's advances. These two are argumentative throughout the book, with Cam being overbearing about Esme's social standing and obligations, but also impressed by Esme's secret career. We also have a deadly threat against Cam's friends to contend with in the background, and after reading this book, I am interested in going back to read about Esme's siblings from previous books as well. The one contemporary romance in the mix here, Love Theoretically by Allie Hazelwood, is uh, her third full-length novel. Elsie is a recent PhD grad with no money and way too many adjunct teaching positions who is on a fake dating app for extra money. One of her clients has an older brother, Jack, who seems to hate Elsie, except he doesn't. And one of the parameters of Elsie's gig has her being vague and untruthful about her real identity and personal information. When Elsie shows up for a physics faculty job interview, she is surprised to see Jack there as one of the other faculty members. Jack is upset because it seems like Elsie is lying to his brother, but Elsie can't tell Jack the truth about the fake dating without her client's permission. It's a huge mess that's complicated by the fact that Jack is actually in charge of the rival branch of physics, and there's another candidate for the job. But really, Jack just feels terrible for having had a crush on his brother's supposed girlfriend all this time, and then he's even more impressed with her once he realizes that she's also a physicist. This book has all the humor and awkwardness that you would expect out of an Allie Hazelwood novel, and super fun to read. Portraits, Passion, and Other Pastimes by Charlie Lane is book one of the Art of Love series. A financially irresponsible Marquess puts his family's livelihood in danger by overspending money on art and frivolity rather than take care of his estate. When his eldest son, Raph, learns the financial state of the place when the steward quits, he shoulders most of the burden of responsibility to keep them afloat. Unfortunately, he also needs to dismiss his sister's governess, Matilda, because there's no money to pay her. But he does promise to always help her find a suitable position. Fast forward 15 years later and the Marquess has passed away and Raph is struggling with all of the bills. His father has donated all of the art to a museum and left none of it for his children to sell, except for five items, which each person needs to earn by creating a piece of art themselves and presenting it to their mother for approval. With no talent and no time, Raph knows that he will not be able to come up with anything to his mother's standards, never mind the loud wailing and grieving that his mother is doing to distract him. He decides to hire his mother a companion and seeks out Matilda as the best candidate. She has served as a governess and a companion in the past 15 years and will soon move to her own cottage. She initially rejects the offer from Raph, but the lady she's currently working for suggests they go together to help the Marchioness with her grief. Raph is also simultaneously trying to save the estate by marrying an heiress, but he doesn't feel anything at all for the ladies that he's courting. 
So he's still kind of hoping that the arc thing will work out. And with everyone back at the Marquess's estate, Raph and Matilda spend more time together. They try to resist each other, but it doesn't work for very long. It's interesting to read all of the family interactions in the story and all the support they have for each other, despite the begrudging feelings toward the old Marquess's spending habits. Undressing the Duke by Erica Ridley is book seven of the Lords in Love series, and it is also part of the Duke in the Box anthology. Donovan is being pressured by his mother to fulfill his ducal duties to marry a young lady and sire an heir. He has no interest in doing so and only has eyes for his valet of 20 years, Jeffrey. He knows that he doesn't really want to be lusting after his valet after he gets married, so he dismisses Jeffrey. However, before that happens, Donovan and Jeffrey have to make a visit to the Marywell Matchmaking Festival so that Donovan can select a bride. Now, while at the festival, they've deg- agreed to act as friends instead of master and servant and find themselves finally giving in to the attraction between them after all these years. This one's another quick read with a nice resolution, especially since Donovan has a younger brother who's besotted with his wife and a bunch of children to take the role of heir. Painting the Earl by Lexi Post is book two of the Marrying a Mabry series. Amelia is the youngest Mabry sister who is focusing on her painting and aims to paint a masterpiece before settling into marriage. When a handsome Earl proposes to her unexpectedly, she offers him a counterproposal, serve as her nude model before they marry. Now, Andrew is in a dire financial circumstances due to debts that his father left behind and needs to marry for money quickly, but he's intrigued by Amelia's proposition and agrees to it. As they spend more time together, he very quickly falls in love with her and hopes that she will someday see him as a desirable husband rather than just a handsome subject of art. We get to interact a bit more with Amelia's sisters, and there's definitely a strong setup for Sister Mariel's future book. This one was relatively low angst and easy to read. We've got another bookshop owner in Bookshop Cinderella by Laura Lee Garkey, which is book one of the Scandal at the Savoy series. Max is doing a favor for his cousin by collecting research and plans for a dinner party from a bookseller, Evie. When he meets her, he is tailed by a few boisterous younger men who disparage Evie's plain and bookish demeanor. He ends up wagering that with a bit of polish, she'll be able to fill her dance card at a ball in six weeks' time. This is basically she's all that, but in a book in historical times. Max tries to enlist Evie to be part of his wager, but she refuses at first until a boiler bursts in her bookshop, closing it down and leaving her without a place to stay. Evie has basically been alone in running her shop and barely making ends meet and has never experienced any balls or parties, so Max's offer forces her to experience new things. Meanwhile, as a duke with no heirs, Max is seeking the perfect society wife and trying to learn from the mistakes he made with his first wife, who was ostracized in society. While Max and Evie grow closer together with their talking and their banter, they both know that the social class differences between them would be unrealistic to try to overcome. This was a fun book to read, and I liked reading about Evie gaining more self-confidence throughout the book. A Study in Desire by Jane McGuire is book one of the Rockcliffe Dynasty series. Impoverished widow Theo has no option except to move herself and her two sons into her estranged mother-in-law's house. The Dowager Marchioness and is basically managing and strict, so it really was the last resort to accept her assistance. There's, of course, a lot of family drama behind the scenes with Theo's late husband being the second son of Marquess and estranged because of his occupation as a poet and his choice of bride. The Marquess himself is embroiled in his own scandal and away from England, and Theo's sister-in-law is a spinster who still lives with the Dowager Marchioness. As Theo's sons are settling into their new home, they're assigned to a new tutor. Jeremy has had his own recent troubles with a broken engagement and kind of a lack of a career. 
Even though he's new to teaching children, he exhibits creativity and care with his charges. Theo and Jeremy interact sparingly at first, but the attraction and longing between them is strong. It was nice to see Theo start to thaw towards Jeremy and trust him as she has seen him continually be supportive and caring. This book had a good blend of external drama and buildup of the romantic relationship within, and I'm interested to see how the rest of the series plays out. The Notorious Lord Knightley by Lorraine Heath is book two of the Chessman series. There's a scandalous book being written anonymously about the seductive exploits of a Lord Kay, and the Ton suspects that the Earl of Knightley, known as Knight, is the man in the story. In reality, he is actually the subject of the story, which is written by Regina, the illegitimate daughter of an Earl, whom Knight had jilted on their wedding day five years prior. We see a few chapters told from the past, interspersed with present-day chapters, and learn more about the past and present relationship between Knight and Regina. He basically left her heartbroken and ruined all those years ago, and she has been trying to rebuild her life since then. The notoriety of the scandalous book has drawn them back together, but there's still a lot of resentment on Regina's side and a lot of guilt from Knight's side. It's interesting to see how they ultimately overcome overcome the issues that kept them apart all those years ago, and learning the truth about Knight's betrayal. Appointment in Bath by Mimi Matthews is book four of the Somerset Stories series. Mag and Evo are from neighboring rival families, but that doesn't stop them from hesitantly forming a friendship and further attachment. This book takes place uh, about the same time frame as book three and results from the rivalry of book two of the series, so it will make the most sense if you've read the series in order. Although even without the backstory, we have a shy and stammering Meg slowly learning to stand up for herself and go after what she wants after she's built up some confidence throughout her friendship with Evo. Now, she interprets Evo's kindness as pity and is kind of dismayed that he only sees her as a friend. However, Evo believes that their friendship is precious and hopes to mend the rift between their families, even if he doesn't know all the details of how bad things are between them. This one is pretty quick and straightforward read. Thank you so much for watching this video. Links to all of these books are in the description box below. Like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. And you can follow me on Instagram at randomolive.